Welcome to African Roots, brought to you by DW. In this podcast series, we discover how individuals from across Africa shaped the continent. I'm Kai Nebe. And I'm Leila Johnson Salami. Kai, I have a question for you. Um, what do you do when you're the first person ever to do something? What do you mean? Like going to the moon or going to Mars? <laughs> or even out of our galaxy um, to other worlds <laughs> millions of light years away. <laughs> um, well, I guess, but I wasn't really thinking that far. Well, uh, thank goodness, because I thought you were about to book me a one-way ticket to Jupiter. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. Let's stay here on Earth, Kai. Um, you know, before the Elon Musks and the Jeff Bezoses of this world, um, most people didn't really have to travel to outer space to be the first to discover something. I, I see what you're saying. But I mean, there are some fundamental facts, um, often Western discoveries that we've always just assumed were facts or never really questioned until someone does come along and turns the tables. Hmm, like what? Well, in researching African roots, I, I came across this incredible story of Sheikh Anta Jop. Um, he was a Senegalese scholar with, quite frankly, amazing abilities, Kai. Um, this guy was literally a brain box. He had degrees in nuclear physics and chemistry. Wow. So why are you bringing him in? Well, he's most famous for pointing something out that today seems kind of obvious. This humanity is born in Africa. This humanity that was born in Africa, this humanity was born at the sources of the Nile River. It was deep black. Then this humanity progressively colonized the valley and it had 120,000 years in front of it to go down from the region of Uganda to the Nile Delta. Okay, wait, wait, Leila, just back up a bit. So that is Sheikh Antediop speaking, correct? He's a Senegalese, but... Why is he talking about Egypt here? Well, you can be an expert in many things. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, but seriously, Kai, I mean, Sheikh Anta Jop made a splash by theorizing that ancient Egyptian culture, which was obviously so admired and still is by the Western world, is African and it's been influenced by people coming from Black Africa. Oh, but Leila... I mean, just if you think about the geographic aspects of it, I, I kind of always assumed that was the case. Well, you would be kind of wrong, Kai. I'm sorry. You see, when Sheikh Anta Jop revealed these findings, and this was in his 1954 thesis um, called Negro Nations and Culture, we were in the twilight of European colonialism. See? It became an uncontrollable bomb. That's um, Abubakar Musa, professor and Egyptology specialist um, at the Sheikh Anta Jop University. <laughs> yes, um, that is the name of Senegal's most prominent university. It's in Dakar. Negro nations and culture became the bedside book of every African intellectual in training and of every intellectual of the diaspora. Of course, Westerners did everything they could to discredit the book. Okay, so let's back up a little. Now, you've got to remember, right, at the time there was widespread racism, suppression, and a general belief among colonial powers, and to an extent also in Africa, that anything good in Africa must have come from outside the continent, right? And this line of thinking was particularly present among intellectuals um, and also members of the scientific community. To them, Egypt was not part of Africa, but rather a part of the Mediterranean. And that was that full stop. So then if that's the kind of background, how did um, Sheikh Anta Diop kind of manage to convince, I don't know, this really hostile community of otherwise? Good question. I mean, some of the criticism was valid. Um, some said, for instance, that Jop's work was revisionist or Afrocentric, even though Afrocentrism wasn't actually a thing then. But you're saying that he really provided a counter narrative to the prevailing Eurocentric thought. That's right, no? Yeah. And, you know, Sheikh Anta Jop was also a very gifted academic, as we know, not just a combative scholar. Um, he was born into an aristocratic Wolof family from Western Senegal in 1923. 
Um, this is a man who won a scholarship to study in France where he was exposed to Western and particularly French philosophy, right? And how the scientific community thought um, and also what was sort of required to be taken seriously. And, and also probably the form of research that he would need, right? Spot on, exactly. And um, after many years of research, Jupp demonstrates his theories based on solid scientific arguments. Um, one of the key things that he did was when he pointed out the linguistic proximity between ancient Egyptian and other African languages, such as his native Wolof. So just to be clear, are you saying then that before this time, before all this research that uh, Sheikh Anta Jupp did, did people really think ancient Egyptians were were basically white or European almost? <laughs> well, the topic is quite complicated, but suffice to say, hardly anyone in the Western world um, has questioned European knowledge on this topic, um, especially um, European scholars, okay? Um, on a simplistic level, think about Hollywood and other popular portrayal of like Cleopatra or Tutankhamun. And here comes a young Senegalese scholar, okay, who essentially reinvents how scholars see the ancient Egyptians. I'm guessing there must have been a fair number of people that didn't take kindly to it, right? That's also spot on. Um, but, you know, because Sheikh Anta Job was so rigorous scientifically, his ideas did gain a lot of attention, Kai. Um, here's Baba Kar Job, professor of history, also at um, Sheikh Anta Job University. He dealt with very complex issues, with the issue of national languages, with the question of federalism in Africa, with energy issues. He was visionary. He set many benchmarks, and I think it's not possible today to talk about Africa's history or even about human history without mentioning Sheikh Ante's writings. So, in fact, um, Sheikh Anta Job was criticized for his multidisciplinary approach and later his political activism. And, like, he somehow managed to do all of this while at college. Gee, I mean, I couldn't even balance studies with pub quiz events at that stage. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> honestly, well, Kai, honestly, um, you're also not Sheikh Anta Jup. Let's not forget that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but quite early on, he um, committed to pro-independent student movements and supported democracy in Senegal. He advocated for a federation of black African states, whether it was politics or science. Sheikh Anta Jup was uncompromising. But let's hear Prof Babakar Jup once more, who actually knew the guy. Sheikh Anta was very humble. I started associating with him when I was a student. He was accessible, that's the first thing. He was frank, that's the second thing. He did not hide his ideas, but of course, if he had to raise his voice, he did it. He did not run from colossal tasks, so he was also a very tough character. Sheikh Anta Jupp stayed in Senegal and taught until his death in 1986. He's really remembered for questioning and, to an extent, disproving cultural narratives passed down by colonial powers. Now, those achievements are pretty big. I don't think there's many academics that can really claim to have changed the way people actually think about an entire concept. But Lele, what you mentioned earlier that sticks with me still, amongst all of this, he was also doing nuclear physics studies. What happened to those? Thanks for bringing that back up. You know, he didn't quite forget about that. In 1966, he established the first African lab for radiocarbon dating in Dakar. Wow. And no, Kai, that wasn't a 1960s dating app. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so glad you cleared that up, Leila. But you know what I'm thinking? What? Tell me. I think Czech Ante Diop was also lucky to count himself among the privileged in the Senegalese society. And that's interesting. It's a big story in itself. But the story I'm going to tell you after the break, Leila, is something very different. And it concerns an untrained South African surgeon and his association also with the world's first heart transplant. You've got me curious. <laughs> DW African Roots. Find new African Roots episodes on dw.com slash African Roots, Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. So what, Kai? What kind of a teaser is that? An untrained surgeon 
at an operation. Leila, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is really an incredible story, and it's one that has been buried for a really long time. While Czech Anta Job tackled prejudice in the academic world and the ivory towers of science, I'm going to take you back to 1940s South Africa. 1940s. I know this was an increasingly difficult time um, for the majority of South Africans. Difficult is putting it mildly. The policy of apartheid hadn't yet formally been introduced, but it was basically there in practice. And it was also there even in the little known village of Nkagane in the Eastern Cape province. A 14 year old boy called Hamilton Naki drops out of school and seeks employment in Cape Town. And I mean, we know that apartheid was segregation made legal. Exactly. And it was essentially the legalization of racial segregation, the putting a legal framework over something that was already in practice. And this was basically never done in the 20th century before. And um, this twisted system essentially treated black people as subhuman. Now, Hamilton Naki's job prospects were poor, to say the least, and almost all of which would have been in the service of white people. And for six years after arriving in Cape Town, he worked as a gardener, and he was specifically in charge of taking care of the gardens at the University of Cape Town. You're a UCT alumni, aren't you? Indeed, I am, Leila, but I wasn't there in the 1950s. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But the University of Cape Town has a stunning campus on the slopes of Table Mountain, and the medical school is close by the famous Grote Skuur Hospital, which is where Hamilton Naki eventually finds himself looking after lab animals. So in those days, medical students needed somewhere to practice. They needed animals to basically practice on and importantly do research. And Hamilton Naki turns out to be really good with animals. Bit by bit, he gains the trust of uh, Dr. Robert Goetz, who trains him to prepare the animals for surgery. It was Hamilton Naki who eventually had reached a level where he could prepare an animal and even perform some surgery and even show surgeons from other parts of the world and from Cape Town techniques. So he was an amazing man in that sense. That's Professor Anwar Mal, a senior scholar at the University of Cape Town, and he's also a respected academic in his own rights. Okay, so this is sounding like a pretty big deal, and we haven't even gotten to the crux yet. It is. I mean, first of all, we're talking about a person who never completed school, let alone high school, uh, and he's basically teaching surgeons surgery. And importantly, the Grote Skuur Hospital was about to make big news in the world of heart surgery. Okay, so what was Naki's job then in like all of this? He was officially a technician in the research laboratory. Apart from training other surgeons, he learned how to perform transplants on animals in the laboratory. Wow. But just this, in the context of apartheid South Africa, where black people weren't even allowed in the same hospitals as white people, uh, you know, as doctors or patients. I mean, this was unheard of. He trained doctors to perform on patients he would never be allowed to touch himself purely because of the uh, racist system that was in place then. So essentially his talents was robbed and used. I mean, Kai, that is very infuriating. I mean, if it's infuriating for us to even think about it, just imagine what it was like for Hamilton Naki. But anyway, this is how Naki came to work with the famous Professor Christian Barnard, the first cardiac surgeon to perform a heart transplant in December 1967. And that was a really, really big deal. This is the first time a heart transplant had occurred anywhere in the world. There had been some misinformation about the man, especially posthumously. Firstly, he didn't take part in the actual first human transplant performed by Chris Barnard in 1967. He was not involved with human patients. That would have been illegal because he wasn't a qualified medical doctor. You know, listening to that, Kai, I just kept thinking, like, surely someone would have kept records of who was present. But then again, records often lie. And that's exactly the case, Leila. Um, This is a situation that is shrouded in mystery. Those involved say he wasn't there. But you have to remember the heart transplant surgery was a major coup for the apartheid government. And at the time, a way to prove that their system was working and that, you know, this separate development model that they had chosen to go with was the way to go. 
And because of this, and because it was such an unfair system, in retrospect, many people never really trusted the apartheid government or what they said or what they claimed. And one of them was, of course, uh, Hamilton Naki's son, who insisted that his father was in fact present at the surgery and in fact apparently even helped, according to the son. But he was never recognized of this because of the fact that he was a black man. But I mean, if the government had, you know, covered up his involvement, why did Naki's name become, or how rather, did Naki's name become so popular? Well, for a long time, Hamilton Naki's name was hardly known among anyone except those who were in the know within that very small medical field. But according to Professor Mull, it's because it had to do with Hamilton Naki's teaching. This was one of the few things that he could do with a certain degree of freedom. This is a man with humble beginnings. He lived in a hostel in one of the townships, and he learned techniques. And when he was asked once, how did you learn this? And he said, I stole with my eyes. So without a formal education, he was able to perform certain surgical techniques on animals, and he shared that knowledge with others. That is the remarkable thing about this man. And that is actually an incredible thing. Here you have a guy who was never taught any of this himself. In fact, he learned everything that he knew by himself. But he was a generous person in that he taught so many other surgeons how to do surgery. And Hamilton Naki did eventually receive recognition for his contribution around research at Groote Skier. You know, two years before his death in 2005, the South African government honored him with the Order of Mapungubwe in bronze. And the University of Cape Town awarded him an honorary science and medicine degree, which is just bizarre thinking about this is someone whose work probably did contribute to the world's first heart transplant, but he didn't even have a degree. You know, that's the part that's still striking me. Like, in all of this, Hamilton Naki did not have a degree, you know? And, it, you know, it shows that when you put your mind to something, or if you're just blessed with a particular talent, um, there are so many things that we think are not achievable that just simply archive. But, you know, I wonder what Naki must have thought and felt. Um, all those surgeries and trainings that he did, knowing that he would never be allowed to reach his full potential... Um, in the same way that someone like Sheikh Antajab did in his field. I think, though, what both um, Sheikh Antajab and Naki did manage to do was really break the stereotypes in the face of this institutionalized prejudice or outright racism among the brightest of the brightest minds of our time at that stage. Mm, and, and also, you know, prove that they were capable, if given the chance, um, with whatever small chances they were given. DW, African Roots. That's where we will have to leave things for today. African Roots is a cooperation between DW and the Gerda Henkel Foundation. Special thanks to our producers Thomas Schmidt, Philip Zantner and our voiceover artists. Contributions by Tamara Wackernagel, Mamadou Lamin Ba and Tuso Kamalo. I'm Kai Nebe. And I'm Leila Johnson Salami. Join us again next time. Bye for now. Bye. African Roots. <laughs>